It's good to see all you mothers out. I, I, you, you know when you, um, when you get men in charge, we're going to give you a little something, ain't we? We're going to give you a little something. Um, so y'all, um, y'all mothers of the church, don't call the office, we know. All right, God is good, though. I'd like to thank uh, all the Combs and Combs family for coming out and participating with us today. Uh, just a few uh, quick announcements. If you are a visitor here for the first time, uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand. We got a visitor. Would you like to say something? Introduce yourself. Amen. Amen. This is God calling. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you. And before you leave, see one of our ushers. We got a, a special gift just for you. So thank you. I, I'm in recovery mode, so I'm going to do a little bit more, um, not from the stage today, so just bear with me. Also, we got a couple of uh, announcements, uh, homegoing services. We got uh, Sister Jones' um, daughter and um, uh, Deacon Jones' sister. Uh, it's going, a memorial service is going to be this Wednesday. Uh, excuse me, May 25th at 11. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm even reading it wrong. It's May 25th at 11 a.m., so uh, come out and support them for that. Um, this coming, well, no, actually on the 20th, um, at 1 p.m., um, our Reverend uh, Williams' um, father, uh, stepfather, um, homegoing service. So it's going to be in the bulletin, so be sure to get that today so you can participate. Um, to all the men, thank you for all that you do for the church and what you did this morning for the women. We appreciate every single one of you uh, getting up. Um, you know, some of our men were here at 630 getting the breakfast ready. And um, I said, bless you, bless you, <laughs> bless you. I, you know. and, and then when I came out, they had the little handkerchiefs over their hand and doing it. I'm like, woo, y'all really, y'all took it to the next level. Amen. And so God has continued to bless us. Um, come out on, on Wednesdays, um, this particular Wednesday. Um, if you are going to come out this Wednesday, let Sister um, uh, Christy know, because uh, we're going to get it catered. Someone's volunteered to cater it for us. You know we eat on Wednesday, so if we, you need to see them if you're going to come on Wednesday and you wasn't there this Wednesday um, to get your, your meal order set for that. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's get with the task at hand. Uh, we're going to uh, look at Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And I want to look uh, from uh, this particular passage from the vantage point, how mothers can teach us to love like God, how mothers can teach us to love like God. If you would stand, um, and I will read it from the NIV, and I'm going to read it this way this morning, and it reads this way. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. <clears throat> and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a pyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then the Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby he was crying, and she felt sorry for it. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, so I'll go and get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you. 
Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed it. And when the child grew older, she took him to the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your very presence. We thank you for the presence in our lives. We thank you for uh, sending us the Holy Spirit to guide us and to direct us. We thank you for your everlasting love for us. We thank you for each and every mother in this place. We thank you for all that you're doing in this community. We thank you for what you're doing for this church. Lord, we ask that I decrease so that you can increase. And Lord, I ask that you open us up so that we can receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For all of us here this morning, I recognize that Mother's Day can be full of emotion. For some, it's a time to remember how blessed we are or have been to have been loved by such a good mother. But for others, it's a time that some people remember what they did not have. Or get from a mother but in all cases as we reflect on mothers today I believe I believe that we all should realize and recognize how mothers have influenced our lives in some way w whether it be a biological mother or an adopted mother or even a mother figure in our lives some women have influenced the way we think the way we act and the way we love others good or bad. And, and, and so this morning, we're, we're going to look at our text to see how the love of a mother changed the trajectory of her son's life forever. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about this text this morning is that our text forces us to examine what we would be willing to do for others in our lives that we love. Now, I came across an article this week that talked about things we should be willing to do for other people in general. And it said that we should be willing to start to be the source of sincere support for other people, whether it be emotional, spiritual, or even financial. You see, loving others means being support for people whenever and however we can. And then the article goes on to say that we should start giving people our undivided attention. You see, there is nothing worse than when you talk to someone and that person is half listening or they're on the phone while you're trying to conversate with them. I hang out with the person and she oftentimes goes silent when I'm speaking to her on the phone and I'm oftentimes forced to say, are you there? And she would oftentimes say, Yes, I'm just searching up something that you just said on the phone. And, and, and I'm oftentimes flustered. But then the article goes on to remind us of how important it is to be present with people when you're in front of them. The, the article goes on to say that people need to start respecting other people who are different than us. You see, all people are important to God. So a question I have for you this morning is what are you willing to do for others who look differently than you do, who, who speak differently than you do, or even have a different worldview than you do? You see, we, by, we all know that the Bible says that we should love others like we love ourselves. And so in, in essence, we are called this morning to do all the things that the article talks about and even more. And, and so this morning, our text shows us just how far a mother's love will go for one of her children, which I hope will spur us to love others like she loved her son in our story. Now, the background of our text this morning reveals to us that the Pharaoh and the Egyptian people recognized that the Israelite population was growing so fast and so much, so much so that they were nervous, the Egyptians were nervous about their own ability to rule. And so the Pharaoh tried to do everything he could to stop uh, the people from multiplying and being fruitful. He, he tried to make them slaves so that the hard labor would kill them off. But that didn't work. 
So then he tried to get the midwives uh, involved, and he said that when a Hebrew boy was born, kill it. But, but with the intervene of God, that didn't work. And so he, he, he grew so flustered, he finally said at the end of chapter 1, okay, whenever any of you see a baby boy who has of Egyptian heritage or Hebrew heritage, just chuck it into the Nile. And this is the context in which Moses' mother had Moses. And it was the same context in which she hatched this plan to save her son from the evil Egyptian system. Now, now the context of this passage might seem very familiar to us today. A, a fear of others. M much like the Egyptians then, this type of fear has seemed to have taken hold onto much of the Republican Party today. You see, the Republicans seem to place a lot of emphasis and importance on border security and deportation of immigrants who are in this country illegally. They seem to only be concerned with removing people from this country, no matter their circumstances or the conditions they find themselves in. While you have the Democrats who seem to place a greater importance on the path of legal status rather than um, removing them. Now, I believe that they're both concerned with maintaining power and control. But it, it seems to me, I, I believe that the uh, democratic um, policy seems to be a little bit more benign. But it doesn't really matter if you are a Republican or a Democrat. What's more important for us today as Christians is that we should love everybody, no matter where they come from, or where we come from. You, you see, we should understand that we shouldn't let the fear of other people drive us or push us into doing things that are not moral or ethically right or righteous. And it is within this context this morning that Moses' mother puts Moses in a basket to protect him from a system that was hostile towards Hebrew boys. And again, this too should be familiar to all of us here this morning, especially those mothers and grandmothers who have black sons or black grandsons or married to a black man. One author puts it this way. In America, black men have historically been depicted as aggressive, hypersexual, and violent, to be controlled, to be uh, exploited, and to be tamed. Black men in America are in fact deeply fragile and consistently at risk of being uneducated. Black boys are more at risk of remaining stuck in poverty. Black men are less on average. They earn less than white men and even white women. Black men make up a large share of the prison population. Black men even on an average die four years earlier than white men. So I'm here to remind you this morning that our community needs mothers like the mother of Moses to protect, guide, and direct our boys in the right direction. So that our black boys can grow up to be black men so that they can do what God has called them to do. And so the first thing that we see in our text this morning is that Jacobed, which is the name of Moses' mother, and we get that from other passages, loved her son so much that she was willing to let Moses go and trust God. L look at the text. Look at the text again. Look at uh, uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. It says, and but when she could hide Moses no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Now, f from this text, it, it gives us a picture of a woman of remarkable courage. You see, th there was a law of the land that dictated that her child should have been killed, but the faith she had in God proved to be the tool needed to save her son's life. Y you see, it, it took faith to just put her child in a basket and put it in the Nile, maybe to never see it again. Now, if it would have been some of us today, we probably would have tried to continue to hide the boy until we got caught. R rationalizing with ourselves, 
At, at least we had more time with the boy. And isn't that like many of us today, too scared to do big things? So we just continue to do the same thing, hoping that big things will happen. You see, I, I, I know people who hope that something big will happen in their lives. But, 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 but they do nothing in their lives to get ready for God to manifest a big blessing in their lives. Leaving God to say, I can't bless you like you want to be blessed because you aren't ready for what I'm about to give you. If you want God to bless you in a big way, start acting and preparing like you're ready to handle the big blessing that God has for you. If you want that big job, start doing things that get you ready for that job. It might mean that you need to get some more training. It might mean that you, you might have to do something that you haven't been doing before. And I, I, I guarantee you, if you start doing what God tells you to do, you will see how God will move in your situation. You, you, you might be here this morning saying, God, I want you to grow my ministry that I'm in. Well, start studying and preparing and asking God to, to, to guide you in the way so that when that ministry does grow, you're ready for what God has for you. You see, I, I'm here this morning to remind you that it is oftentimes us that are so laid back that, that, that we just want to continue to do the same thing and then get mad at God because nothing big is happening in our lives. You, you see, we need to be reminded often that it takes big moves to make big change. Now, I, I imagine that there were some parents during that time that had Hebrew boys and just let their sons die at the hands of the Egyptians, rationalizing to themselves that it must have been God's will for this to happen because it's the law of the land. And, and, and again, th that is like some of us today. Just go along to get along doing whatever the world tells us to do. Too scared to challenge what is wrong in the world. Waiting for others to do what God may have called you to do. What if our forefathers and our foremothers just sat around and waited for others to change many of the Jim Crow laws in the South or, or the codified laws of mistreatment of blacks in the North? Like them, God might be calling you into action to make change in the society in which you live. And, and, and so the actions of a mother in our story this morning remind us today that trusting in God's word matters. And that it means that you have to be in defiance of the law of the land to trust God, then, then you, that's what you're going to have to do. You, you, you see, in our text this morning, we see a woman who loved her mother so much, I mean his, her child so much, that she was willing to defy the law of the land and take a chance for her son. And, and, and that is what we see in the text. And... and, and, and the text is really telling us that we shouldn't put anything or anyone in front of our relationship with God. Amen. You see, your faith in God should be strong enough yes, that there's nothing in this world that should, should shake your trust in God. That, that is what black folks found out in the 1960s and the 70s. Under the conviction of God's word, they found out that there is something worth dying for, that, that they found out that there was things going on in this country against black folk that it was worth going to jail for. So, so the question I have for you this morning, are there things in your life, are, are, are there some beliefs in your, your, your worldview strong enough that you're willing to die for or go to jail for? I, I know some of you here this morning saying to yourself, preacher, you, you're talking crazy now, die for, for, for stuff about Christianity? This is not foreign or a foreign concept because we have veterans in the house and they were willing to die for this country and I thank you for your service. So if we are willing to die for this country, we should be willing to do the same thing for what we believe in. If the gangbangers are willing to die for a color, we as followers of Christ should be willing to, to be embarrassed for sharing the gospel. 
or, or we should be willing to accept being talked about for doing what God wants us to do. You, you, you see, I, I, I know that it's not always easy to trust God with your children. And, and, and so that's why Jacobed's story is so important for us to understand and grab hold to this morning. You see, this mother trusts God with her son, Moses. And we need to learn to trust God with our children and our grandchildren. But, but the principle here is broader than just our children. It, 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 it's true that, that, that our children are important, but the, the, it, it should be that important in all our relationships that we are in. You see, true love oftentimes means that we have to know when it's time to step back and let God. I, I know when my two boys went off to college, especially Robert. Uh, he, he went off to college in England, and I was so nervous. And, and, and I was at points, I wanted just to tell him, I said, just, just go to a college nearby. I can support you better and all those kind of things. He, he was going to a place I'd never been. He, he was going to a country that I wasn't very familiar with, only went to once. And, and, and I remember just at the airport, as I dropped him off at the airport, and he was going to start his new world. I, I was just so tempted to say, no, let's just call this off. But I, but I, I, I remember in the car, I, I prayed to myself. I said, God, I'm just going to. Stop, relax, and let it go. And I said, I give my son to you, and I'll see what will happen. And it's, only, it's not only with, with your kids. It, many of you know, if, and you heard my preaching, you, you know I, I have a friend who's an alcoholic. And, and oftentimes I was so tied up trying to tell him what he should do and he, what he shouldn't do. But I got to a point in my life, I said, I just got to relax and let it go. Give him to God. And pray constantly and continuously that God have your will be done. And that's what we're called to do this morning. We're called to, with the people we love, to relax, let it go, and give them to God. You see, true love, trust the sovereignty of God. If you want to love like the mother of Moses, you must learn to love through the lens of trusting in God. That means trusting God enough. With the people you love, it means loving people enough to know that God knows better about them than you do. Now, now, the next thing we see in this text this morning is that the mother of Moses had his sister watch for him from a distance. Look at the text. Verse 4 says, his sister stood at a distance to see what should happen to him. Now, this part of the text is telling us that once you release the people we love to God, we shouldn't just sit back and walk away and tell ourselves, okay, we're done with that situation. You, you see, when I dropped off my sons, one to the airport and, and I drove the other one to San Francisco State and I dropped him off, I, I just didn't say, I'm done with you. I, I, I did release him to God, but every day that first few weeks, I would call them, I, I would text them, to see how they were doing. And they'll often text me back and, and say, uh, Dad, I need some money. But, but I, I realized that money was not going to stop a bullet. M money was not going to make them decide right. It was only God in their lives that would make them do the right thing. Now, th th there might be other things in your life other than people that you need to release to God. Th th that job, that, that ministry, that, that bad attitude, that, that spirit of non-forgiveness, that apathetic attitude towards life. You, you, you know what you need to release to God this morning. You, you see, we, we must understand that letting go and letting God is a daily, moment-by-moment -moment decision and choice. Like every discipline in life, you must learn to surrender and give it to God. You, you see, the enemy, the, the, the devil, seeks every day to cloud your mind with worry, doubt, and fear. So I'm here this morning to remind you and to let you know to let go and let God have control. Let go and let God have your worry and fear. Let, let go and let God have your finances. Let go and let God have your future. And when you do, you will see how God will bless you. You see, in our text, when Jacobet released her boy's future 
to God. She then had her daughter stand by to see what God was going to do next. And so in the text, the next thing we see, and look at verse 9, it is the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse it, nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Now we see in this text how God will work. You see, when you release it to God, then stand back and see how God will work things out and work things through. Isn't God here? Look at the text. You see, not only did her faith save her child's life, but she benefited from the circumstance. And that's good news today, that even in this life, whatever the devil means for evil, God will turn it around and make it a blessing for you. That's a kind of hallelujah sentence, that God will turn the things around in this world and make it a blessing for you. She got paid for taking care of her own son. She, she became her own son's nanny. Look at how God works. And that's a word for all of us here this morning. Stop thinking you can solve your own problems better than God. You see, God will do a better job every time. I, I don't care how smart you think you are. I, I don't care how much time and how much wisdom you think you have. You cannot do better than God. Now, the last thing I, I, I want us to see in this text this morning is that a good mother does things that help others develop in a way that is pleasing to God. Look at the text. L look at verse 10 again. It says, And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now, Bible scholars inform us that Moses' mother probably was nursing Moses from 12 months to three years. And in that time, I imagine Moses' mother had an opportunity to pour into Moses' life the things that he would need to be the kind of person God could use for his glory. And this story is a living illustration of what a good mother does for the people she loves. You, you see, good mothers protect their children in many ways. A, a good mother protects her child uh, physically. They, they, they protect their child from danger. That's why a mother said, you can't go there, you can't touch that, you can't do that. Because a mother cares about the physical being of her child. A, a, a good mother uh, protects her child morally, t teaching their child right from wrong. That, that, that's why a, a good mother forces their children to go to Bible school. That, that, that's why a good mother forces their children to go to church. That's why a, a good mother says, you have to read the Bible. That's why a good mother says, you got to do the things that will develop your morality. So, so you don't go out and be the type of person that will end up on the news. You, you see, a, a good mother is a mother who protects her child emotionally. But that's why you oftentimes see a mother says, I don't believe that guy or that girl is good for you because he's going to emotionally damage you for life. A, a good mother watches out for a child. Yeah. A, 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 and a good mother protects their child spiritually. The, 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 that's why a good mother brings up a child in the love of God and, and to fear God and, and to serve God. And, and so the question I want you to ponder this morning is are you doing the things you see the mother of Moses doing in the text? Or, or are you loving people in your life like the mother of Moses? Or, or are you loving until it hurts? You see, oftentimes we, we, we take this picture of love like the world takes it. And the world says that if you love someone, it, it, it's got to be, be a feeling. It, it, it's got to be, it's gotta be you, you got to feel good about it. But sometimes you, you got to love your child so much that you give them a spanking. Yes, you, you got to love your child enough to say you can't go here. And, and realize and recognize and understand 
that when you love your child or you love the people around you and you give them kind of boundaries that they get upset at you. It's not always nice when, 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 when your child is mad at you. It, you know, people say, oh, it hurts me to whoop you. It hurts me more than it hurts the child. But what, what people are really trying to say is your response to the spanking that you get, the, the, your response to me hurts me because you, you, you're going to have a visible uh, uh, disgust about your whooping and about me. But if you love your child enough, and if you love people around you enough to give them boundaries, e even if you're an adult and working with other people, you've got to give people around you a boundary. They can't treat you any kind of way. They can't speak to you any kind of way. You, you can forgive them, but, but people who are around you, 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 you can say, I, I forgive you and, and may the love of God be around you. But if, if, you, if you break one of my boundaries, don't expect me to interact with you. I love you. I'll do what Christ tells me to do for you. You see, are you making conscious decisions about how you interact with people and the things you do together? You see, loving people really means that you shouldn't be tempting them or promoting others to sin. You see, protecting people, it really means loving people and you're willing to let go and let God. Give them to God, knowing that God knows better Amen. about them than you do. See, loving people are always, or it means always being ready to assist others when God opens the door Amen. and gives you the opportunity. You must always be ready to help others. Loving people always means bless others as God blesses you. Amen. Loving people means that it means taking people.